thank you for coming to the inaugural uh, conference for our epistemic utility for imprecise probability conference. Um, our project is focused specifically on constructing reasonable measures of accuracy for imprecise probabilities, which roughly capture the extent to which any imprecise probability model uh, um, commits a kind of generalized type one and type two error, and then using these things for various purposes. But that's not what the conference is focused on today. This conference is a, a conference aimed to bring two communities together. Um, the philosopher is working on imprecise probability, and then uh, the ICIPTA community. Um, we think um, it would be beneficial to both communities to be in conversation with one another. Um, and so today is a very, or today and tomorrow, we'll have a very broad set of talks on a range of topics in imprecise probability. Um, and to kick us off, our very own Catherine Campbell Moore talking about beliefs as probability constraints. Cool. Thanks a lot, Jason. And yeah, it's great to be speaking here. Oi, 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 oi. let's stop that. <laughs> okay. Um, it's now, it's like props. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good. Um, so beliefs as probability constraints. So this talks about different ways you might model beliefs. So then we've got various models out there in the literature. I mean, this is a talk, I mean, given the title or the theme of this talk, I guess some of this stuff will be familiar. Um, so you might think of beliefs as captured by probability functions. That's maybe the most traditional um, view. But there's other views out there. We might think about comparative relationships, like more or less confident. You might go imprecise and think, for example, now there's different models of imprecise probability. For example, you might capture it as a set of probability functions. That's probably most familiar to the like philosophy members of you know, this conference. There are other models, so a set of desirable gambles would be more, more along the ICICTA crew um, line. So these are different like models of belief. I'm proposing a new model of belief given by, well, it's called the probability filter model. And what this is focusing on is probability constraints, which is why the title was about probability constraints. But first, why? why this new model um so it's proposed to it's meant to retain the niceness of probabilities and capture all that power but it adds additional power overcoming certain limitations um some of these limitations are already accommodated in other models but the one i'm working with is a kind of unifier it's meant to be powerful it does lots of cool stuff and also i think it's quite nice, direct, easy to work with, natural, trying to spell out some of those, like niceness, naturalness stuff is kind of work in progress. But I think this kind of model has some intuitive appeal for it, and it's really powerful and does lots of cool stuff. So what is this model, this probability filter model? In this, we're going to focus on probability constraints. So a probability constraint I'm thinking of it's something like the probability of rain is bigger than 0.7. That constrains the kind of, that's a constraint on the probability functions or formally it's just a set of probability functions. Um, uh, yeah. So you have a set of probability functions that kind of gives you the probabilistic constraint, for example, the constraint that the probability of rain be bigger than 0.7. That's an example of a probability constraint. And the model I'm giving focuses on these probability constraints to capture what your beliefs are like. So your beliefs are captured by a collection of probability constraints. So it's this squiggly B, um, calligraphic B, that's your model of belief. You're capturing your beliefs by this squiggly B, it contains various probability constraints. 
For example, the constraint that the probability of rain be bigger than 0.7, which formally is just a set of probability functions. So formally, this uh, belief model is given by a collection or a subset of the power set of probabilities, a collection of sets of probabilities. The sets of probabilities are the constraints that you believe or think that or something like that. So it can very naturally capture various sort of probabilistic judgments. We can talk about these things in a quite direct way once we can talk about probabilities. When you think that the probability of rain is bigger than 0.7, that's just captured directly in the model by a set of probabilities, all of those that make the probability of rain being bigger than 0.7, that's in your belief state. You can capture other judgments. For example, um, your judgment that the probability of rain is bigger than the probability of your train being on time this afternoon. Well, we can think of that as a probability constraint. Formally, it would be the set of probabilities such that the probability of rain is bigger than blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, if, it's officially, it's a set of probabilities. And we capture your judgment that the probability, it's more likely that it's gonna rain than my train's gonna be on time by making this set of probabilities be in your belief state. You can similarly capture a judgment that you think that um, rain provides positive evidence for your train being late, like, given or conditional on it raining, my degree of belief in it being the train being on time is increased. That is captured by a set of probability functions um, that is going to be in your belief state if you think that, you might think that. You can also capture judgments, not just about, um, so, we can capture your judgment that um, I think that they'll probably I think that there'll be um, between 25 and 40 inches of rain next year. We can capture that by a set of probability functions, all of those whose expected value for this probable inches of rain thing. Um, we make that set of probability functions be in your belief state can capture comparative judgments between gambles if you think that this one, the expected value of this one is higher than this other one, then we put um, that set of probability functions in your belief state. Um, so it can do comparative stuff, it can do conditional comparative stuff, it can do some stuff about expectations and estimates of gambles, it can also do some things which are um, which would be captured by non-convex sets of probabilities. So we might just think that the probability that you're going to pick a red ball out of this sack is either a third or two thirds. Why? Well, maybe the sack has three balls in it. You know, one is red, one is blue, and the other one is an unknown color. What's the probability or how likely is it that you pick a red ball? Well, either a third or two thirds. So we can just directly encode any of these sorts of judgments, which are things we might want to, you know, we might want to say of someone or say of ourselves that I think that it's more likely to be raining than that my train was on time. And we can now directly capture that as an opinion in my belief state in this in this uh, B, which is representing my opinions. So it's a direct way of capturing judgments, and often the sorts of judgments I think we can think about and talk about. And it's meant to be natural and easy to work with. What I'll talk about a bit more today is its power. So its ability to capture and unify various models of probability, oh, various, I mean, extensions of probabilistic models that are out there in the literature. So starting off with the idea that it can um, uh, work that's done on precise probabilities is like a special case of this. It can capture the sets of probabilities and it can capture some other models, which we'll talk about. So in the precise probability framework, we just have a particular probability function. I'm gonna call it P star. And that's like your beliefs are given by this particular probability function, P star. What does that look like when we're in the probability constraints framework? Well, it's a framework where you think that the probability is identical to this particular P star. 
Formally, that's given by the singleton of this probability function. That's a judgment you will make. It's a, something in your belief state. You think that the probability is this, this particular function. But also it's gonna have weaker judgments as well. So for example, if um, this particular probability function makes the probability of rain be 0.8, then you're also going to think that the probability of rain is at least 0.7. It's a weaker judgment. It's a, um, um, it, well, since this particular P star has that property, the probability of rain is not bigger than 0.7, that's a judgment that you should make, and it's something we should put in your belief state. But of course, we're in this, you know, uh, as is known, um, or has, has been well discussed, precise probabilities are pretty damn restrictive. So, for example, we might ask, what exactly is the probability that it will rain on this particular day next year? Is it 0.8? Is it 0.75? Is it 0.787? Dot, dot, dot. If you're in this precise probability framework, you need to answer this question. You need to give a particular value. And we might think that that's too strong to ask of someone. The way that looks in this framework is that the precise probability version is fully opinionated. That is, for every probabilistic constraint, either it is in your belief state, or its uh, complement is. You either think, yes, I agree with that probability constraint, or no, definitely doesn't satisfy that probability constraint. You think either it's like this or it's like that. So this um, restriction to precise probabilities corresponds to a restriction that um, you're fully opinionated. For every, um, for every probability constraint, you're always like, yes or no. There's no space for like, hmm. But we can now easily drop that. We can allow a hmm framework. You can think that the probability of rain is bigger than 0.5. You can think the probability of rain is less than 0.9, but you might suspend judgment on whether it's identical to 0.8 or not. That is, you might think, uh, so neither this probability constraint nor its complement is in your belief state. So we can't say of you, you think that it's identical to 0.8. We can't say of you that you think it's not identical to 0.8. Is it identical to 0.8? Hmm, question mark. And that allows us to get these imprecise probability frameworks. There are various um, imprecise probability models that are out there in the literature. So here's one of them. We capture your beliefs by a set of probability functions. Um, how does that look in this framework in this probability constraints framework. Well, that set of probability functions is supposed to be sort of the ones that you think are still open. I don't know, we could have a bit of a discussion about exactly how to read it, but um, well, you think that the probability is like one of those things. You think, well, it's like one of the things that's in this um, boldface P, but nothing more than that. So for any like particular probability function in there, you're not gonna think that it's like that. It's only got the properties that all of, the, all of these guys have. But if all of the members of your belief state of this uh, boldface P think, for example, that the probability of rain is bigger than 0.7, then, um, then you're going to think that the probability of rain is bigger than 0.7. That is, uh, sorry, this is supposed to have a, for any probability constraint where every probability function in the sort of boldface P, so this one that's doing the representing, if, um, if you have a probability constraint that all of those guys satisfy, you think that one as well. So it's got any of these two sets. That means it's sort of closed under like probabilistic entailment. A uh, probabilistic entailment in the sense of you sort of got judgments about the probability and um, um, if, you, if you think this one and you think this one and you think this other one and every probability function that satisfies each of those satisfies this third thing, then you're going to also think that uh, other one as well. Okay, so where are we? 
we've got this probability constraints model. It's this squiggly B, calligraphic B, which is like you think thus also probability constraint. So it's modeling your beliefs by uh, the probability constraints that you think. Maybe I should say you believe, but then we have to have other discussions. Um, so it can capture these models that are out there, like precise probabilities and this creedal set slash sets of probability functions, possibly non-convex, that's all fine. We can capture these models um, in this framework. It can do more than that, but let me first of all say, so before I continue with the expressive power line, let me just have a brief side that says some stuff about the niceness of it. So you might say, well, why bother moving to a framework like this? Why don't I just stick with my uh, sets of probabilities or my precise probability framework? I mean, one reason is I think it's um, quite a natural way of talking about some of these things. Like it gives you a direct way of talking about some of these things. I've been trying to work on other kind of advantages. Um, so for example, it might provide a nice connection with evidence. Maybe we sometimes think about evidence as directly providing probability constraints. When we do something like Jeffrey conditioning, we say, well, you should update your probability function, make sure you satisfy these new things, and now you update it in a sort of somehow minimal or rich way in order to satisfy those things. Maybe we can think of those, satisfy those things as a probability constraint. So maybe the evidence coming in to us looks like probability constraints, and now there's a nice tie. Um, it can capture sort of irrational judgments, which, um, um, here's a sort of irrationality someone might have. They've not drawn out the probability constraints, uh, probabilistic consequences. So they think um, um, they, let me just give you a silly example. They think that the probability of A is 0.7. They think that the probability of B is 0.9, but they sort of haven't realized that they think A is more likely than B. So they um, don't think the probability of A is bigger than the probability of B. Now I'm gonna call that thing, I'm going to call that thing irrational, but at least, but I think that um, these irrational things might nonetheless be interesting representationally for some kind of irrational agent. So it has a, some kind of power like that. Okay. So what do I think about rationality? When do I think such a belief state is coherent? Here's what I'm saying counts for coherence of such a um, probability filter. That's why I use the term filter, is I think the rational uh, Bs, the rational um, like, yeah, belief states set. So this B is a set of probability constraints. I think it should be a filter, that's this mathematical structure. And its key pro properties are, <clears throat> if you, believe P, if you think that P, and you think that, so P is a set of probabilities. Um, so for example, the set of, I mean, the set of probabilities making the probability of rain equal to 0 0.8, that's a set of probabilities. If you think that, and Q is a superset, for example, the set of probabilities that make the probability of rain at least 0 0.7, then you should also think um, you should also think this thing because it's weaker. So it should be closed under supersets. You should think weaker things. Um, it should also be closed under finite intersection. So if you have, if you think the probability is like this and you think it's like this, you should think it's like, um, like both of those things. So if you think the probability of rain is 0.8, you think the probability of my train being on time is 0.7, you should think the probability of rain is 0.8 and the probability of um, my train being time is 0.7. So those are the formal uh, properties. Um, there's also some like make it non-trivial, like make it non-empty and, and like, so you, you don't think anything that's inconsistent and you think uh, the 
tautology. So actually, we have to be a bit delicate about here, because do you want to encode the axioms of probability? Like, I think that probability satisfies the axioms of probability. Uh, probably you want to do that, but you know, we might replace it with other things like, do you want to be it to be sigma additive? Do you want it to be regular? Blah, blah, blah. We might have discussions there. Okay. Now, that's all I'm going to ask of for coherence. There is a stronger thing you might ask for, which um, I'm not going to impose. And this is an axiom that says, if you think a bunch of stuff, and in, like infinitely many things, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, dot, dot, dot. If you think all of those, then you also think, um, well, the intersection or anything, let me, let me, maybe it's um, easier to see if we write it out the other way. So if we have um, Q1, Q2, dot, 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 all of those things, you think all of those things and some other probability function is like entailed, that is every, every precise, pro every probability function, which is in Q1 and in Q2 and in all of those stuff, is in some new set of probabilities p then p is also in b so what this says is it um you can draw out probabilistic consequences of infinitely many of your beliefs simultaneously you can piece together infinitely many p infinitely many of your beliefs and draw the consequences that are expected from you now, I'm not going to impose that restriction. It's something you totally could impose. Um, and if you impose it, you get exactly back to the sets of probability model of belief. Um, that is representing your beliefs by a creedal set. Why aren't I going to impose it? Well, maybe because I think it's less plausible than the finite stuff. And also just the note that like by restricting it to the finite stuff, we get some additional cool power. So two kinds of powers we get here, they're actually quite closely related. Firstly, you can capture sort of infinitesimal probabilities, hyperreal probability stuff. Secondly, this model of belief, this probability constraints model of belief can capture these models which are used in the imprecise probability community, the sets of desirable gambles model of belief, for example, that's not, that goes beyond or has some expressive power that can't be captured in sets of, in the like uh, framework of P's, of the creedal sets, sets of probabilities. But it can be captured uh, by our probability filters when we allow for this expressive power of not being able to draw the infinite consequences or not requiring of someone that they have drawn the infinite consequences. So um, what does this look like on this kind of infinitesimal probability side? Well, here's something we can do in this framework now. You might ask, what's the probability that this dart exactly hits? A particular point on the real number line, like 0.5. I'm going to throw a dart at a number line between 0 and 1. What's the probability that it hits the exact point 0.5? Not like close to 0.5, like exactly 0.5. What's the probability that it hits that? Well, we might represent your beliefs about this case in this way. You say, well, um, it has to hit exactly 0.5. So it's probability that it does that is less than a tenth. So it's like less than a tenth of the space. It's less than 0.1. The probability is also less than 0.01. It's also less than 0.001. However precise you go, it's probability that it hits 0.5 exactly is less than that. But maybe I still think it's possible. And maybe I can want to capture this notion that something's possible uh, by giving it probability bigger than zero. So this belief state, you think that the probability is bigger than zero, but smaller than any particular number bigger than zero? That belief state 
fails to satisfy this axiom, in fact, is even a bit worse than that. It's like inconsistent, it's like infinitely inconsistent. Like um, there is no probability function whatsoever with all these properties. Um, but nonetheless, maybe it's a <laughs> rational belief state. Um, we have to do a bit more work about justifying, interpreting and stuff. But anyway, at least this framework's available. So what this does now is, instead of having to extend our framework of probabilities to introduce new numbers, like the infinitesimal numbers, and more generally, like hyper, you have to extend the real number line to the hyperreals, we don't need to do any of that funkiness now. We can just keep our old-fashioned real numbers, but have the sort of complexity, <laughs> we can have the complexity coming up somewhere else that is in the infinite structure of things you believe. Okay. Um, so, we've got this uh, probability filter model. We've got this beat. It can capture, um, let me just, I haven't got a good slide here. Um, so we've got this probability filter model, this B. It can capture, um, it can capture um, imprecise probabilities. That is when those things are given by a set of probability functions, this P thing. It can also capture infinitesimals. Um, and it kind of nicely creates a hybrid of those two things. What I wanted to do for the sort of remaining time um, is talk about some other frameworks of imprecise probability, which um, are um, which have been used elsewhere. So in particular, um, there are frameworks of imprecise probability, which are like, no, we shouldn't think about um, your, your imprecise opinions as given by a creedal set. Instead, we should um, think about them as your opinions about whether some gambles are desirable or undesirable. That's this model, which is like a set of desirable gambles model of belief. And the probability filter model can also capture all of the expressive power of that sets of desirable gambles, this uh, D model of belief. And important in doing that is something like this non-Archimedean behavior, this um, um, the sorts of infinite inconsistencies in probability that we have allowed is important for capturing the expressive power of the desirable gambles framework as it's usually given. The axioms that are usually imposed on these sets of desirable gambles can, can, can like um, consider some of this probability. Well, in order to capture all of that power of sets of desirable gambles, you need this something like this um, non archimedean infinitesimal behavior. And by having allowed that, we can now capture that power. But the expressive power of that framework is kind of incomparable to the expressive power of the sets of probability framework. So this um, sets of probability framework can't capture some of this like boundary behavior, probability zero, non archimedean structure that this desirable gambles can. But the um, desirable gambles framework can't capture differences in non-convex sets of probabilities. And the probability filter model is going to be able to capture both of those and unify them in the same way, relatedly, uh, that it could capture both the kind of sets of probabilities and the um, infinitesimal probabilities and create a unifying framework for both of those. It can similarly capture both of these and create a unifying framework. It's actually another model of belief um, already in this literature, which is choice functions, which sometimes or often formally is thought about instead as looking at sets of desirable gamble sets. Um, it's 
it then creates a more natural extension of this sets of desirable gambles framework. Um, and the probability filter model can also capture all of that choice function framework, or at least uh, you have to clarify, you have to. I have to be a little bit careful saying all of because I impose an extra axiom, but like, yeah, it can do a lot of it. Um, okay, so the probability filter model is very powerful. It can capture sets of probabilities. It can capture set of desirable gambles. It can also capture these um, sets of desirable gamble sets, sets slash choice functions when we impose a so-called mixing axiom. So, what I'm going to do now is talk a bit about this framework. Um, but instead of just like presenting that framework and showing how the probability filters can capture it, what I'm going to do is talk more generally about choice in an imprecise setting um, and how this probability filter model captures with judgments about choice. And if I then have time, I'll then talk about the, the particular kind of more precise model there, which I think, I'm, well, I know we're going to hear about that later. Jasper's going to talk about that afterwards. So um, it should link up. OK, so let's talk a bit about choice in this framework. So the idea is you've got a particular belief state, which I'm capturing by this set of probability constraints, collection of probability constraints, those constraints that you think. Um, and I'm going to give you a collection of options or actions, and you're going to have to say which ones are good and bad. Um, I think I've already talked about this. Why am I bothering to talk about this? Well, choice is important. It helps us understand the framework of probability filters a bit better, or maybe it does. Um, and because of this um, proposal of it as a model of beliefs in the same spirit as desirable gambles, which I cut from my talk because there was too much stuff. Um, so hopefully things are understandable, but yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to be trying to talk about how to choose. And what I'm gonna ask you to choose between is, well, or the objects of choice here are gambles, I'm thinking, or this is the representation that's kind of more familiar. Anyway, that's the framework I'm using. So a gamble is um, this thing, it's got some uncertain outcome, and you've got different possibilities, possible ways the world might be like. And in each way the world might be like, it gives you some particular real number value. It, that We can think of that as the payoff of this gamble. We can also think of these gambles just like, just like old fashioned acts, like should I take my umbrella out or not? Um, well, that might lead me to me getting wet um, or it might lead to me like carrying a heavy umbrella around and being completely pointless. If we fix a utility function, we can kind of translate those outcomes into particular real number values. So I'm sort of assuming we've got a fixed utility function around in the background. And then um, you're choosing between actions, which we can just think of as choosing between gambles will just pay out a certain amount of money or not money, utils, pays out a certain amount of utils in the different um, ways the world might be like. So we're, we're, the objects here are gambles. <laughs> I'm going to give you um, this thing A, which is a collection of gambles. We might call these these available gambles. You've got a collection of available gambles. And now for any particular gamble in there, you've got to say, well, is that a good choice? Is it a bad choice? Given your belief state, which choices are good or bad from this collection of available actions with fixed utility function, i.e. gambles. So you've got a collection of actions available, fixed utility function, for any particular one in there, for any particular gamble in there, is it good or bad? Now, we're in this probability framework, I'm sort of using probabilities around in the background to talk about belief. And so probabilistic expectation is going to be doing a really important role here. 
So just going to write it out a little bit. Um, I mean, we all know how probabilistic expectation works. There's various ways of writing it. I mean, officially, I guess I'm supposed to be writing it like this, which is um, the expected value of the, the expected value as evaluated by this particular probability function of the gamble G. That's just you take all the different ways the world might be like and um, how likely they are given by the probability function and how good they are given by well, the gamble. I'm going to write it often as PG. Um, so that's like the dot product slash you might just think of it as a shorthand notation. Um, but just telling you I'm doing probabilistic expectation isn't enough to answer the question of which gambles are um, choice worthy or rejected from a set. We're going to have to have another feature, which is a choice procedure. Um, there is actually, a, there is a lot of work of choice in the imprecise probability setting. And actually, um, I'm not engaging with a lot of that here, partly because I wanted to connect it back to this um, um, choice function model of belief thing. Okay, so that's just a flag that there's a lot of other stuff. Uh, I'm just going to be talking about some of it. Okay, so this choice procedure, what are the choice procedures I'm thinking <laughs> about here? Well, there's two, there's two ones which I'm going to talk about. One is based on E admissibility, and one is maximality. And I'm going to be following, or I'm going to then be adopting the kind of E admissibility notion or something closer to that. So what are these choice procedures? How do these work? Well, here, I'm going to tell you, here's when, um, here's when it would be bad to choose gamble G from this set A. It's bad to choose G if you think that there is something else in the set which will do better. Sounds intuitive. Okay, if I think there's something else that will do better, I shouldn't choose G. How are we going to spell that out? Well, actually, it's kind of cool that you think that is now just directly in my framework. That just means, well, all this stuff is a uh, probability constraint. And is it a probability constraint that's in your belief set? Is it something that is, that, yeah, is in B? So I'm capturing you think that as something in your belief state. There is something else. Is there some other thing F which will do better? Now here we're using our probabilistic expectation to judge whether F will do better than G. So the way I would capture this as um, is the set of probability functions which think that there's something else which will do better is that a set of probability functions that you think that is in your belief set? I can write it this other way because everything's closed on the supersets. Um, equivalently, we might say, is there some set of probabilities um, that you believe where each of them thinks that something will do better? And this then looks much more familiar to um, if we've got just like set of probabilities framework, this would, we can kind of ignore this. And now we're just talking about that particular set P. Um, but since I don't have a set of probabilities around, I have to say, well, is there something in there? So this looks very similar to what we would do in the set of probabilities framework. That sounds like an, well, at least uh, on the face of it, quite an intuitive notion of when you should reject an option. Order of quantifiers can sometimes be delicate. And um, this is one way of kind of capturing something like this intuition. Here's something else which looks on the face of it quite similar, but is quite different. Is there something else that you think will do better? So here I've sort of switched the something else and you think that. And essentially that's switching the order of quantifiers. Um, so here, all you needed to have is that every probability function thinks that there's something better. It doesn't need to be the same thing. Each probability function can have a different thing that they think is better. Maximality, on the other hand, says, well, no, there has to be something particular which every probability function thinks is better. 
And we would capture that by saying, well, there's something else where, um, where you think that, that you think of that something else, of this particular thing, F, it does better. So these are two different notions of when you can reject an option from a set, um, um, which, I don't know, have been distinguished in the set of probability framework, and they just can naturally tie over to this um, uh, probability constraints framework by just adding this, like, we're just looking for something that you believe that has this property. It doesn't need to be the set of probabilities that's representing you. It's just a set of probabilities that you think. Um, or we can capture it in this way, which is just saying you think that this thing about probability. So these two are equivalent. So I'm going to continue by thinking just about this e admissibility notion. Um, why do I do that? I mean, one reason is the epistemic, sorry, the representational power that you get from choice functions over set of desirable gambles kind of requires going this e admissibility route, or at least allowing this e admissibility route. Just choice according to maximality um, doesn't get any additional power over the set of desirable gambles framework. So if this was this was like a more powerful model that can um, encompass desirable gambles and non-convex sets of probabilities, you kind of need to do e admissibility or at least allow e admissibility. You can't just restrict your maximality. Why don't I then have like an, um, it's kind of open to you to pick whether you do e admissibility or maximality. I think that might be the right way of going, um, saying that every person has um, their belief state plus something else, a choice procedure, and those two things come together to um, represent the things that they like. But I don't want to put that choice procedure stuff inside the belief state. I think we should keep that separate from your beliefs. So your beliefs are given by the, the calligraphic B, the probability filter. There might be another feature of you which um, is do, which is allowing well e admissibility slash maximality slash some combination. Um, okay, um, I, when am I supposed to be stopping? Okay. Um. Turns out I've a lot. A lot. It turns out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me just carry on saying a bit more about this and I won't get through everything, but that's okay. Um, so I've been describing this as when a gamble should be rejected. And this is like your epistemic state is judging that this gamble should be rejected um, or given your beliefs, you should reject this gamble. Usually e admissibility is thought of as a kind of positive thing, like something's choice worthy if some probability in the set makes it, um, uh, thinks it has highest probabilistic expectation. Um, one reason I don't go with that framework is it's much easier to translate the um, rejection thing into the um, desirable, into the belief, uh, into the probabilistic belief setting. If you wanted to then give the judgment that this gamble is admissible, you would have to just like add a negation in front. So that would be like, um, um, yeah. So if something's e admissible. How do we translate that to the probability filter setting? It's when you don't think that there is some. Uh, sorry, I'm on the wrong on the wrong line. You don't think that um, uh, there's something else which is better. So we just add like a negation to capture the e admissibility. So. One reason I don't I do it with rejection rather than uh, choice worthiness is it's much easier to translate into the framework. The other reason is using this term choice worthy. I'm not sure we get to use that term choice worthy when something is not rejected rejected in the e admissibility sense. <coughs> what do I think is choice worthy? Well, I think when we give a judgment of choice worthiness, it's a kind of an active judgment. It's like a positive yes thing. Maybe not, yes, you have to do this, but like, yeah, that's okay. Thumbs up, go ahead. I'm okay with that. 
positive judgment, i.e. something that you think, i.e. a belief, something in your belief state, that's the way we're going to do it. And here's when something's choice worthy. If you think that um, this particular, this G is better than any, or at least as good as any other option. So something's choice, you think that it's choice worthy if you think the G is amongst the best options, it's bad, it's at least as good as anything else. Now, often there's going to be nothing whatsoever that you think is choice worthy. What should you do? What should you pick? Good luck, your beliefs don't like fix that fact slash maybe we need to do something else to judge that fact. But like, there's some kind of, I'm not sure if I totally agree with e admissibility being the notion of rejection, but um, I'm kind of less happy with it giving the notion of choice worthiness and think at least it's epistemically interesting to have a more positive judgment of choice worthiness, um, like, like really choice worthy. It's like, yeah, definitely okay. And that's something else. Sometimes nothing in the, you've got no available option that's definitely okay. Good luck now. Um, go ahead, ah, whatever you choose, you're going to be kind of like, mm -hmm. um, and we should somehow represent that when we're doing stuff. Okay. Choice functions have been given as a model of belief in the same spirit as sets of desirable gambles, extending that. And the way we're doing that is, is giving judgments about when a set of gambles contains something you think is desirable. Um, we will hear much more about that in the next talk, I believe. I'm just going to like flip through this, say, well, we can translate that back and forth through rejected choices. It's just like a representational choice. And kind of, and just say this, this theor the theorem is probability filters can capture all the expressive power that people are doing with these choice functions at least when we include this so-called mixing axiom. Um, okay, probability filters are really powerful. They can capture um, um, all these choice functions, including the mixing axiom is basically, I'm using e-admissibility. You want to get rid of that axiom, you have to allow an additional thing, which is like a choice procedure, which like allows sometimes the admissibility, sometimes mixing us, uh, so, sometimes uh, maximality, etc. And then I have some slides which um, are saying that actually probability filters goes beyond these um, choice functions, the least, and. One way which it does so is that it has judgments of at least as good as, which aren't derivable to judgments about strictly better than. And I have some kind of thing that says, oh, here's a counterexample that says we can't derive the one from the other. How can you capture the full power of probability filters? What does it look like? It goes beyond choice functions. Well, it's equivalent to having the sort of, so this would be the set of strictly desirable gambles, the ones that you think where there's something at least strictly better than well zero you might also have a judgment about when you think there's something that's at least as good as zero you might also have a judgment about when you think there's something which is equally good to zero so it's equally good as the status quo if you allow all those three things then you're equivalent to probability filters um so like yes it's expressively powerful yes it goes beyond those choice functiony stuff, but once we extend the power to these additional things, then it looks the same. Now, proving results and getting exactly the coherence constraints, I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure this is true, but you know, there are dots, uh, T's to be crossed and I's, whatever. Um, what do I think about, um, I'm just gonna stop there, okay. Lots of open questions. This like thinking about these probability filters is a kind of a, uh, a big thing. So let's just summarize. 
I propose this new model of belief, this probability filter, it's going to naturally capture various judgments, various probabilistic judgments, like you think that the probability that it's going to be sunny is more than a half, like it's likely to be sunny, it's more than, it, it'll probably be sunny. You might also capture the judgment that you think a gamble G is desirable by having the set of probability functions which probabilistically expects it to be better than the status quo is something that you think. When is it coherent? Well, I require this finite. I restrict the coherence just like finite consequences stuff. Um, you could go for the infinite consequences version and that would get you exactly the model of sets of probability functions like creedal sets. Um, I'm al allowing that you don't draw that infinite probabilistic consequence. And then we can capture additional expressive power like the sets of desirable gambles framework and also this choice functioning kind of framework. Um, so it's very powerful, it kind of unifies a whole lot of stuff that's been talked about. I also think it's very natural, it's very natural and like direct and has cool features. Cool, thanks.